So welcome today to our Startup Ecosystem Expert Interview. I'm very excited to have today an expert for the Singapore Startup Ecosystem. In every of our Startup Ecosystem interviews, we are looking at um, different countries and regions and what is special there, who you should know, uh, what kind of startups are emerging there and how international entrepreneurs or international startup enthusiasts can actually enter these ecosystems. Today, we have Paul Myers here and he will help us to get a better glance at the Singapore startup ecosystem. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Yelta. Happy to be here. Um, first of all, we would like to get to know you. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience that we know who you are and what you do in the Singapore startup ecosystem? Sure, happy to. Um, I've been in Singapore 30 years, uh, just about 30 years. I'm American originally. I came to Singapore as a filmmaker, not as a startup person, not as an entrepreneur. But um, uh, start, my startup experience started really with Internet 1.0 and helped start a company that was four of us to begin with and ended with 650 of us in a NASDAQ listing, kind of the whole rocket, Internet 1.0 rocket ship. Uh, and there I learned to raise money and set up remote teams and uh, understand the entire public company process. Uh, and once bitten, I kept going down that path. So I helped start that company. It was called AsiaContent.com. Uh, and we brought um, uh, Western media brands to the Asian internet space and did localized versions in eight different countries. And I was a co-founder there and a COO for a while and then head of business development. I then went on and started another couple of companies and uh, uh, probably one of the more successful ones was I, uh, I had a company called Acme Mobile and we were the largest distributor of mobile games in Southeast Asia. This is before there were app stores or Google Play or anything like that when you were buying games and ringtones from telcos. And so I had a team of about 40 people across Southeast Asia, ran that for seven or eight years and eventually sold that. Um, I, I, I then moved into, after a couple of years of doing different kinds of things, um, I moved into the space of helping other founders, right? I started you know, mentoring, although it wasn't really called that, it's more like just giving advice, uh, and eventually became the EIR, the Entrepreneur in Residence for Mox, the mobile only accelerator, which is part of SOSV, uh, one of the largest uh, venture venture companies in the world right now. And I was the EIR for Southeast Asia. And that led to me running a, um, an accelerator program, a regional accelerator program for Telstra, the Australian Telco. And that was called Moodoo D. And we had an early stage accelerator program across Asia. And eventually then moved on to the Asian Development Bank and helped them set up their venture fund for uh, early stage impact um, uh, ventures it, across Southeast Asia, or across all of Asia, actually, and um, uh, then ended that, and and COVID hit, and I reevaluated what I wanted to do, and I decided I, I wanted to go full time into being a coach, and a founder coach, very specifically into being a founder coach, taking what I've learned over the the previous years, you know, all the bumps and bruises, and some successes, and a lot more bruises, and you know, be able to to provide uh, guidance and assistance to to younger and newer for founders, uh, I didn't have the seven to 10 years of patience left to do another startup to change the world, but I could help you change the world. So that's kind of my role now. My company is called Asia Founder Coaching and uh, I, I'm the coach. Amazing introduction. Thank you so much. Sure. So let's dive now into Singapore and why this is an amazing startup ecosystem for people. Singapore is, is, is pretty unique. Um, in that the government is very hands on in terms of economic planning. Uh, early on, you know, Sing Singapore it was a very small country when when they became independent about 55 years ago. There were about a couple million people here, uh, uh, not very developed, uh, and the government took a very hands on pro planning uh, uh, stance and approach. And over the years, they brought in different technologies to both uh, 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 create jobs, but also to enhance enhanced skill sets of the population. And that was very successful. Singapore at one point was the largest manufacturer of hard drives in the world, for example. And that was very much because the government decided that they wanted to bring in uh, this particular industry and they targeted it and uh, made it easier for hard drive manufacturers to come here and set up and, and train people and create jobs and create wealth in the community. Um, and they're very successful at that. And um, gosh, about 15 years ago, really at the very start of the whole entrepreneurial startup ecosystem days, the government decided to put resources 
at that point mostly money into um, making Singapore a startup hub and and make it easy for companies to to start here and grow here. Singapore is still relatively small for people who don't know about it. It's about six million people now. Um, and but you know that's still pretty small. You you look at New York or you look at Jakarta or you look at Bangkok and they're you know the cities are bigger than and have more people than Singapore does. So um, the government's very conscious of um, making sure that there's growth and economic growth and that people are trained and people uh, have job opportunities and it, it continues. And they've been very, very successful at doing this. You know, if you've seen pictures of Singapore, you've visited, you see it's an extremely modern city. And uh, a lot of that is due to the government's very, very you know, very strong vision and uh, execution prowess to make that happen. So say 10, 12, 15 years ago, the government decided that they wanted to get in on the startup scene. They see Silicon Valley, they see a little bit of what's going on in Israel, they wanna do that. So they started putting money into startups, um, government funds, uh, government programs with some degree of success. It wasn't super successful, but they learned and adjusted and ultimately got to the point where they started to, uh, rather than invest themselves or hand out money or grants directly what they do is they they funded a number of uh vcs local vcs or joint venture vcs with, with outside of singapore to be the the in investment arm right and so the money partly came from singapore government and partly came from um you know just like with any venture capital firm you know there are independent investors who are there uh, different kinds of partners lps um so then um that covered kind of the initial seed stage funding um, and a number of companies started up that way and some were successful some were not um, but over the years the the singapore government also un understood that there needed to be different tax laws and different investment capabilities and make it easy for angel investors to come in and benefit from investing in in startups um, so that ecosystem has essentially grown now to a very very strong one and if you look at all of southeast asia um and ASEAN the Singapore is kind of the leader that way in terms of uh, the 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 structures put into place to enhance the ability to grow companies and grow startups so you have a concentration of VCs here uh, both uh, uh, locally grown ones and foreign ones and joint ventures okay who operate regionally because Singapore is a relatively small market so um most of the VCs here in Singapore invest regionally and either that's Southeast Asia or it's across Asia including up into you know Japan and Korea and and, and India um so you have that you have a, a number of accelerators here you have a number of corporate innovation hubs because there's a number of um, regional HQs for multinationals here. And so there's an entire ecosystem that's been built with a plan in hand from the government to make this happen. So what, what's happened then is you have a number of successful startups, um, starting from creative technologies. If you remember your sound blaster card, if you're of a certain age, that was kind of the first, the, you know, the, fir the first public, excuse me, kind of consumer facing uh, successful story. Um, but then, uh, there are a number of companies that have gotten to the unicorn stage and have been bought or uh you know gone public um including c uh you know in the gaming space or garena or companies like that um but i think the majority of the companies now that are coming out of singapore are fintech uh, fintech deep tech uh focused because that's where the government is is putting its incentives um one of the ways that they do this is they make make uh, money available in certain uh, sectors in order to draw cap capital and expertise and other companies in, and then you know startups kind of grow around that space. So it's been very smart. They've done a very, very good job. And I think um, because of that, other countries around Southeast Asia now are looking at the Singapore model and saying, hey, we want a piece of that. We want to make that happen. So um, Indonesia, about seven or eight years ago, said, uh, we're going to do a public-private partnership here to help create um, uh, uh, an ecosystem of entrepreneurship. And it meant changing some investment laws and changing some legal structures, but they've done that. And now Indonesia is kind of booming on the, on the venture side. Uh, you see it in Vietnam, you see it uh, starting to happen in the Philippines, a little bit happening in Thailand, but you know, everybody looks at the Singapore model and says, wow, that's really great. So that's part one. Part two is the government has made it extremely easy to set up a company here. 
I mean, if you have, you have, you know, you and I this afternoon can go in and we write a check for a couple of thousand dollars and we'll have a, a private limited corporate structure by the end of the afternoon. I mean, it's very, very easy to do that. It's clean and clear. So what happens then is that a lot of companies that, they, that may not be domiciled here in Singapore, they may be a Philippine company or they may be an Indonesian company, they'll put their, um, their assets here and they'll put their corporate structure here. And that's where the investment comes. And that may even be where the IP lies because the legal system is clean and clear the financial system is clean and clear everything's very easy and you know this it's not messy or or confusing so if you're if, if you're a silicon valley vc it's very hard to go into a a, a a country especially for americans who don't understand you know the the americans don't understand how the legal system works or the banking system works and it's it's not familiar but singapore has made it really easy clean clear international standards and so a lot of the regional companies then um, have their IP here and have their bank accounts here and have their money here, which obviously is good for, you know, Singapore uh, and, and keeps them in the center of the universe, which is, you know, kind of the point. But they've done a really good job at doing that. And it's been very much government hands on and saying 10, 15, 20 years out, we want to do this, 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 and this. And then generally they do it. You know, it may be a little different by the time they get there, but, you know, they, they point the ship in that direction and off they go. And then very good at it. <laughs> let's, let's dive more into the opportunity of the Singapore market. Sure. Got it. Cool. So next question. What's the most important thing or hidden rule that founders should know if they want to build a startup in Singapore? I, I, I'd say there's two important things that founders need to know if they're expanding to Singapore. Well, three, actually. One, and this is, this, this is my soapbox, is you need to know why you're coming here. Right. If you think you're going to become a big player instantly in Singapore, you know, really look at that and study that because it's it's it's, it's it looks it's deceptively easy looking at it from the outside. It's a good place. It's a great place to be for a regional headquarters and a regional hub. Okay, because you're you're within two hours of you know Bangkok and Jakarta and KL and Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. You know the the so the centers of, of a lot of the ASEAN countries are very close to here, very easy, multiple flights, boom, 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 those kinds of things. Um, and having a headquarters here is important, um, but it's a very small market. So if you're looking to sell domestically, especially on a consumer product, it's, it's pretty tough because um, I'd say, you know, two thirds of the population here, so call it 4 million people are, are Singaporeans and I'd say a, a third are workers from abroad. So they tend not, not to be your customer base, you know, if you have a consumer product, right? So you have a customer base of 4 million people, which isn't really that big. Um, and there's competition no matter what sector you're in. So selling into the domestic market here on a consumer product is pretty tough. Um, but there are a lot of corporates here as well. And there's a lot of corporate regional HQs or internet, you know, maybe, maybe the headquarters themselves. So if you're looking at, and fintech products and banking and different kinds of you know deep tech now which is the focus you know that's a that's a pretty good sale but what um you'd be looking at and coming to singapore i would say if i'm advising you as a company would be look at it as a regional play and this is going to be where you'll set up because it's easy to set things up okay but uh, and this is a big but uh, because it's so small there's very little local talent okay so if you're looking for software engineers get ready to, you know, it's, it, 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 you got to spend a lot of money because you're competing with everybody else. Google's here, Meta's here, the banks are here, you know, if, unless you're paying those kinds of fees to your team, it's going to be very hard to find quality people. So a lot of local companies then um, now hire outsourced development or, or have teams in Vietnam or Taiwan or used to be Ukraine or Estonia or wherever. Um, initially the government wasn't happy about that because they wanted you know to have full employment here and you know it's their money and and but uh i think everybody understands now that there's a limit to how many people there are in singapore and you know you could have you could have a hundred great software engineers but if you need ten thousand of them um it just doesn't exist here so a lot of your technical um human resources are going to probably be somewhere else Okay, that's 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 a big surprise to people, I think, when they come here. Um, and also that 
uh, if you're looking at it with regional sunglasses on, every country's different. You know, Thailand's Thailand's not the Philippines, not Indonesia, not Taiwan. You know, each country is a different market with different laws and different consumption patterns and and different kinds of companies that have different kinds of needs. So, um, from afar, and I'm I'm talking like as an American here, but I see it from Europeans as well. That from afar, it kind of looks like a, a unified block of oh, ASEAN looks cool, you know. But it's very very distinct, different com- countries, um, uh, laws, regulations, industries, and so Singapore is a great place to to domicile yourself, but each one of those places is a very different market. So being prepared for A, um, lack of human resources, uh, technical human resources on the ground, and B, um, it, it's not one size fits all coming to the attractive 800 million people of ASEAN, you know, which looks like a nice juicy market. It's, it's really like seven different countries, right? I think those are the big surprises that I've seen for companies uh, setting up here. You already uh, covered actually my next questions. What are the biggest struggles for entrepreneurs or startups to start in Singapore? Uh, so talent and the diversity of the markets that you're actually looking at. Is there anything else where you would say this is a particularly hard struggle for entrepreneurs in Singapore or startups entering the Singapore market? Um, I think a lot of founders are surprised by the competition in Singapore. Um, you know, it's a small com- country. Uh, from afar, it looks like it's pretty easy. Come on in, set up, and and step on the gas. But uh, in most instances, uh, you're going to find competition in the sector that you're in. Some of them well funded, some of them domestically uh, funded, some of them already regionally established. Excuse me, uh, some of them regionally established, so that you have uh, more competition than it would look like initially from afar. So I think. Um, I, I teach a course on expanding in Southeast Asia, and one of the things I recommend, you know, like every three minutes is come get your feet on the ground, research, talk to people, understand your market really well, um, because uh, what it looks like from afar is, is different than what it is when you're actually on the ground here. And, and uh, so while Singapore has this great, beautiful open door saying, yes, come on in, we'll help you set up, we'll get you a bank account, we'll get you these kinds of things. That's great, but you know that's different than actually doing business here. You know, establishing your business is really easy. Doing your business might be harder than you initially anticipated. So doing research first and coming here and coming to the different markets where you're thinking of expanding is very important. And expansion is pretty much required if you're coming to Southeast Asia, which means you know Singapore. So now let's look at who are the people that you would recommend other startup founders to know if they want to dive into the Singapore startup ecosystem. So those can be VCs, other startup mentors, founders that are super helpful, anybody who's really open to support founders on the ground or entering the market. Good, good question. A little, a little history is required to answer this question, I think. Um, Initially, there was no ecosystem in Singapore, a startup ecosystem, right? Uh, there were no lawyers who were focused on this. No, you know, uh, your your big four or big three accounting firms were not used to doing fundraising or Series A rounds or angel rounds or anything like that. There was no infrastructure for the the support of a startup company. <clears throat> Excuse me. Over the years, that's changed. Um, and now there is, which is really good. And then come in all different flavors and shapes and sizes, you know, small companies to help you set up your business or, you know, big PWCs to handle like, you know, really large accounting uh, kinds of multinational issues, you know, everything in between uh, exists here now. Um, <clears throat> similarly, with there were initial accelerators were set up here. And there were lots of people set up accelerators and the government funded them and different companies funded them. But as in other parts of the world that we've learned that accelerators can do so much and uh, they don't return capital very quickly. So that if you're a corporate and you set up your accelerator, it's not gonna pay for itself in three years. It may pay for itself in 10 years, but generally corporates are not like that patient. And, you know, there's a change at the board level or a change at the CEO level and, you know, the strategy changes. So the, the accelerators disappear, the corporate ones disappear. And um, I think we've gone through that whole cycle here. So now what we've seen is, and finally it's starting to happen where uh, founders have gone through the entire cycle of building companies, uh, if not selling their company, or at least, you know, 
being able to monetize some of it and now investing again into other startups, right? Uh, and that's really the inflection point, I feel, to make the next phase of what's going on here in Singapore important because it hadn't gone through that whole cycle yet. And one of the things about Silicon Valley and you know other, other um, areas where, where you see a lot of uh, startup success is that the founders then reinvest in other companies either they start new ones or they do angel investments or seed investments you know in different other startups and they help other founders right and, and if you don't have that growth is pretty small and slow in, in the ecosystem but the past three years four years maybe um I, uh, that's changed here in singapore and you've had founders who have gone through the entire cycle and now reinvesting and starting their own new companies or funding somebody else and and so so that that's really accelerating what's going on. So, um, a and B, the same thing happens with the the VCs. You know, like you, know, you raise a fund and you hope that in three or five or seven years you have some successes and you get the money back and you can start a you know get a new fund going or a you know uh, uh, grow grow the the funding mechanism. So. We're seeing that as well. So on both sides, the founder side and the investor side, you have experience now. People have gone through the cycles. They understand how it works, um, the the good, the bad, and the ugly of how, how all of the, the startup ecosystem works. So there's some wisdom here and there's some money here that has experience, right? And I think that's really important. So there's, uh, a, let's start with the government then. The government makes it very easy to, for companies to set up in Singapore if you're in specific targeted sectors right now, deep tech is one of those sectors, okay? FinTech was, it's a little less so now, um, but like deep tech and uh, uh, a, a lot of food food related uh, startups are, are being attracted to come to Singapore because the government has said, these are areas where we wanna excel and we wanna build up our, our strength. Um, so the government has some programs for that. Uh, it's, that would be the first door I'd knock on uh, and look at uh what what part of the government's offering what kind of incentives and what kind of money and how do they make it easy to, to land and set up here um there aren't too many accelerators left independent accelerators left um one that i like quite a bit because i used to work with the people who run it is called uh, accelerating asia and it's kind of like uh it it it, 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 it assumes that you're already a relatively successful solid startup uh and you have you have traction and you have a team and you have a product and you have product market fit and all those kinds of things. And it, in many ways, it's kind of like a graduate uh, accelerator program. OK, it gets you to the point where you can start to raise money. Um, so that's very good. It's hard to get into. It's very competitive, but they're very successful um, and they attract the best VCs as well. So that if you're in this accelerator program, uh, um, Accelerating Asia, they will they will help you get in front of the VCs and introduce you. And there's a good relationship there. Um, in terms of VCs, local VCs that I know and work with earlier stage startups. So Golden Gate has been around for a long time. Golden Gate Ventures, they've been around for a long time. They were one of the very first uh, VCs that got initial funding from the Singapore government and have grown to, you know, they have a few nine figure funds now, uh, at least one. Uh, I, I don't have my facts in front of me, but at least one nine figure fund that they're investing in regionally and uh, they tend to invest at different levels of a company's growth. So they'll stick with you. Okay. So this was already great advice on some institutions and organizations to know if you want to enter the Singapore market, but now coming to people uh, mm -hmm. because at the end. Great startup ecosystems, they are based on people, right? The founders that come back and invest, who would you say are three to five? amazing people in the startup ecosystem in Singapore that you would recommend anybody that they should know them? Okay, great question. Um, I think what we've seen in, in Singapore are founders who become investors or investors who have moved on to work at key positions at, at sort of your, your three big supporters of the ecosystem, you know, Meta and Google and AWS all have programs that support uh founders here so some people i i'd recommend speaking to jeff payne from golden gate is certainly one of them he was he's like the original one of the original og kind of uh vcs and has been through it from very much the 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 first days of being a venture capitalist here um and has be, been very successful and is 
uh, very happy to share information. Um, a, a, an early accelerator program here in Singapore was called JFDI, um, uh, maybe the first one actually. And so there are a lot of alumni who have come out of that. It doesn't exist anymore, but a lot of the alumni who have come out of that now have positions in the ecosystem. So Adrian Tan, who is one of the people there uh, now helps startups out of uh, uh, AWS. Uh, Fanny, Fanny Sue Biel uh, uh, is doing the same thing for Google for startups. Uh, these, these are people who have been in this business now for 10 or 12 years and have really seen it grow from, from nothing to this. And they have a lot of uh, expertise and viewpoints on that. Uh, Michael Blakey from Cocoon uh, Ventures as, came as an angel investor from the UK and now has been um, uh, has a, a small but powerful venture firm here uh, based here called Cocoon Ventures. And he's very generous in terms of his knowledge and learnings and, you know, very frank, but uh, is always willing to talk and help other other founders. And I think that that's, that's really important on those fronts. So those would be some of the people that I'd recommend. Cool. Coming to the last question. Mm -hmm. So we dive into the startup ecosystems. Today, we dive into Singapore and we pick your brain on what to do and what to know about Singapore. Mm -hmm. However, we also want to return the favor and we want to know what the global community can actually do for you, how they can help you. Is there anything where we can support you or the listeners can support you? The last couple of years, I've been on this new adventure of be, becoming a coach, right? And, and unlike my advice to founders, I didn't research the market first. I didn't look for where there were gaps. I did none of my research. I just decided, hey, I'm going to be a coach. Uh, I didn't follow my own advice. And so um, I've had varying degrees of success doing this, but I've learned a few things along the, along the road. And one of those is that, um, especially for first time founders, asking for help can be hard, right? We all know um, if you've been in, in the, in the driver's seat um, as a founder starting a new company that it's very difficult on many fronts there's a lot to learn there's always going to be problems there's a lot of emotional wear and tear there's family partner wear and tear there's uh you don't sleep well you don't eat well you don't exercise well uh, and so for many founders it's very hard to say help i need help yikes you know uh reach out a, a, a and b it may not be apparent that um, it's okay to do so and see they may not know where to go to ask for those kinds of assistance. So as a coach, uh, what I'd say is um, reach out, ask questions. If you're, if you're stressing and you're having problems and we all do, it's not just you and it's not a dirty little secret. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means that, you know, you're in the middle of it and uh, there is expertise out there and there is experience out there. And both with other founders, but then also with specifically with founder coaches um, who have been founders who could understand what's going on, um, reach out and ask questions and ask for help. And that's uh, that's what I'd say is, you know, if you have and are experiencing those kinds of things, and we all do, you know, feel free to get in touch. My uh, my hashtag is better call Paul has a nice ring to it. And that's exactly what it is, is, you know, come, come and, you know, let's see what we can do together. Let's see how I can help you. And if I can't help you, let's see if I can steer you to places that can help you. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean raise money or make your company successful, but it means less wear and tear on you and helping you become a better founder and maybe change the world uh, in a very positive way, which is why you're doing this, right? So I'm, I'm all for that. And I'm all for supporting founders in that. So. That's what I'd say. This is amazing. So if you are an entrepreneur looking for a coach, reach out to Paul. Um, and you can have a first session chatting about what problems you have. And I can definitely underline this uh, and stress this not enough. Uh, as a founder, you will face tons of problems. And not everything is about business. Um, so you need someone to, to uh, steer, to, to talk with. Right? Paul is here for that. Thank you so much. This was an amazing session, really good insights on the Singapore startup ecosystem. And um, yeah, we are looking forward to connect you to other global startup ecosystem experts in the next couple of sessions, hopefully also more a deep dive into the region, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, um, because all of this is very exciting and different, as you mentioned. And yeah, looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Paul, and have a great day. Great, thank you.